Hey guys, my name is Parker Lee and welcome to Connection. Here at Connection, we're all about connecting with God, connecting with those in our community, and connecting with each other right here in this building. If this is your first time with us, I want to say a special welcome to you. We are so glad you've joined us here today. If you're a regular, I'm glad you're here too. You see, the church is not this building. The church is the people, and it wouldn't be the same without you. Now we're about to get started with worship, but before we do, we've got just a few announcements. First, on the screen right now is a QR code. If you open up the camera on your phone and point it at that code, it'll take you right to our connection card that you can simply fill it out on your phone. There's also a section in that connection card for your prayer request. If you fill that out, it goes directly to Pastor Charlie, so he knows how to pray for you, and we as a church can come together to pray over your life. This code can also be found above the giving box near the door. We believe that it is our habits, not our thinking, that shape our life. While we can't pass an offering plate around, we've set up three simple ways for you to be able to continue to bring your tithes. The first is by text. Simply text SFUMC plus the amount you want to give to 73256. The first time you do it, there will be some simple instructions for setup, but after that, it's as easy as texting. You can use the giving boxes located by the door. Simply place your offering there on your way out. And you can give anytime online at first-umc.org using the giving tab. We have a few opportunities for you to serve and get connected with others. The first is our hospitality team. These people will help us get the sanctuary ready from making sure the coffee is fresh to greeting people at the front door and putting out the notes. If you'd like to help with that, let Pastor Charlie know or put it on your connection card and we'll make sure you get connected. Every Sunday night, College Life Group meets right here in this building. So tonight at 7 p.m., we invite you to do life with us. We wanted to give you an update on our COVID protocols. At this time, we will continue to require masks indoors and maintain a six foot distancing for seating. We're also working on additional worship times for Easter Sunday next month. We will look to gradually reduce restrictions following Easter Sunday. Now, we're about to continue our series, Hashtag Gospel Filter. But before the band kicks off with the music portion of worship, take a moment to stand up and say hello to someone around you. Nothing 
can stand against the power of our God. morning. How's everybody doing? Doing good? Great. Thanks so much for being with us this morning. We're about to lean in a little bit deeper together. There's no, no matter what you're going through this morning, the battle belongs to God and we are already victorious in Him. Doesn't mean you have to feel like you are, but the truth is, in our faith, we are victorious because we know how the story ends. And I have to remind myself from time to time that my greatest defeat and my greatest struggle has been swallowed up in the grave and brought alive in the victory through Jesus. Doesn't mean I have received every single thing about that just yet, but restoration is in Jesus and comes in Jesus and new life is in Jesus. So you've come to a good place this morning, not because of us, but because the Spirit of God is here and He's about life. He's about you. He loves you just where you are and He invites you to come closer this morning. So think about that.
from your heart, let this echo. Proclaim this truth. You take when the enemy meant for evil, turn it for good. Turn in for good. Wherever you are this morning, find your place in this. You take when the enemy meant for evil. Turn in for good. Turn in for good. Just turn it around. You take when the enemy meant for evil. Turn in for good. Turn in for good. story ends. We know our place in the story. And yet, if someone in this place this morning, that's not true for them, that they don't know their place in the story, I pray that today will be the day they realize that you have called them to yourself. That you've created them for something more than just an American dream, whatever that is that you created them for eternity and it has been in their hearts since the beginning and that you are right here with us now speaking to us even healing us revealing yourself to us your purpose and will and we are ready to see that more and more in your word this morning we pray for this time together, the preaching of your word through Charlie, the message on him. And may we respond to you. It's in your name. Amen. You may be seated. So we continue in our practice through this entire series called Gospel Filter of reading a first century hymn together. This is Philippians 2, 5 through 11. And so we're going to read this together. The words ought to be on the screen. It's scripture, it's an ancient hymn, and it's also the heart of the gospel itself. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, 
God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bend and in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen. Yeah, see, eventually we'll get it. You have to listen to each other when you do this, right? When you read corporately, you can't just read the way you want to read. You have to go, are they, am I ahead of them? Am I behind them? What am I saying in the same translation? Yeah, you know, wherever you are on that, that's what happens. That's the practice of habit. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, reading the same scriptures over again, it starts to become a part of who we are. And that's why we do it. Um, so if you haven't been with us, this has been a fun series. I'm, we're just now really kind of getting into it, but I want to give you a little bit of a like two-minute recap of where we're headed, and then we're going to dig into a first topic. We're calling it Gospel Filter. Now, the reason we call it that is because this is not really necessarily worldview. We have Christian worldviews. You've heard that phrase before. The gospel is a whole way of orienting our life. And what we talked about a couple weeks ago, that the world is not as it ought to be, and we can see that. We can look around and go, yep, that's not right. Nope, that teacher shouldn't give me that quiz again this week. Like, the world is not as it ought to be. And we recognize that. And then we talked about seeing the world the way it actually is. As fallen. Twisted by sin. Distorted by sin, but not destroyed, right? That the original intent God had in mind is what we get when we say the world is not as it ought to be. We see, we can see the way it ought to be because God has put that on our hearts. And then last week I talked about being, a, being redeemed and restored. I talked about this idea that the way things are is not the way it's meant to stay. That our intent is to figure out what we can and will do as followers of Jesus. Now, if you're tracking with me, there's those four words there, right? Ought to be the way the world ought to be, the way it is, the way it can be, and the way it will be. But here's the code. <laughs> those are four words that you hear outside of church that are deeply connected to four words you hear inside of church. Creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. Ought, is, can, will. It's the gospel code. It's the gospel filter for seeing the world. The way the world ought to be was the way it was created, or the way it was designed to be in the first place. Work wasn't supposed to be work. Relationships were not supposed to be drama. None of that was the way it ought to be, it was the way it was created or designed to be, was God's original intent. Sin makes it the way it is. The fall made the world the way it is. And God didn't leave it that way, but sent his son to redeem it. That's what God can do about our sin in our life and help us to redeem that. That's not the end of the story either. The Christian faith is about being a part of the restoration project which would be a cool sermon series name. I'm going to have to keep that one in my head. Being a part of the restoration project. And I told a wacky story about my bathroom imploding, right? Like, we're not supposed to just stay where it was, and God has given us our fire insurance. That's the word, you know, that's the funny phrase about it. Like, you, you won't go to hell if you place your faith in Christ. But that's not where Christianity stops either. He has invited us into restoring everything to the way it ought to be. Now, when you think about that, and you start to look at the, th the challenges that we face, then literally you can run all of the challenges that we face through that filter. When you have a problem, when you have a challenge, you inherently know this should be better than this. This not, is not the way it ought to be, but this is how it is. What can I and what will I do about it becomes a problem-solving filter or grid that basically tells you every challenge, not only the ultimate, the ultimate challenge, being sinners, being fallen, being messed up, is fixed by what God can do and what he will do, right? But every challenge that we face can be run through the same filter. There is something about the way this challenge hits us. We know it ought to be different. What can we do about it? What will we do about it? How will we participate in the restoration project? It means we can orient our entire life around gospel participation. Now, what we often don't do is, one of the things we do actually is, we think we know how to fix it. And we do this crazy thing where we go, here's my plan, God, here's how I'm going to fix it. 
and we ask God to bless our plan. <laughs> right? I know how to fix my problem. Here's how. God bless it. Instead of, how can we fix this? And so a, go- a gospel orientation is, how do I surrender my life so that God can work through me to restore whatever it is? Poor Matthew, my six-year-old, is going to be, he's, he is, first of all, he has plenty of sermon illustration and ammunition. Spend one day with him, and you're like, there's a sermon, there's a sermon, there's a sermon. He has no choice. He will be in my sermons for the next 13, 14 years or longer, right? Because he's six. And if you know Matthew at all, he likes to take things apart and put them back together. When he was three, he took the cabinet doors off of our kitchen cabinets. Got a Phillips head and back, literally backed the screws out of the cabinets until they were hanging like this at three. He loves to do that. You give him a ballpoint pen, it'll be in 20 pieces before the sermon's over. He takes stuff apart. He's not real good at putting them back together. He's six. <laughs> he just, yes, just yesterday, our backyard looks like a battle zone. There's everything from Nerf guns to sports equipment scattered all over the backyard. There are what looks like bombing pits where he is dug in the, in the yard. Like you walk in my yard in the back at night, you will break your ankle. You have to get with me because I can guide you through the minefield. Like there's huge divots in our yard where he's been digging. He goes, look, Dad, there's a pipe. I'm like, stop digging. You know, <laughs> there you go. Well, yesterday I'm out there and I noticed, and this is one of his favorite things to do, is to find my tools and use them in places like he did with the cabinets. And so yesterday I noticed that like a spade that I have and a garden fork were laying in the yard too. I'm like, he's been digging with those. That's why there's these huge pits. And so I go to recollect my tools and put them back because several of my tools have rusted in the backyard in the last two weeks. I go, well, can't use that anymore because he's left them in the grass out there, whatever. In fact, when the snow melted a few weeks ago, all these Nerf guns became unearthed that were just scattered all over the yard. So I pick up this gardening claw and I notice that one of them is bent, like it's bent inward a little bit. Matthew's standing right there. I had this get bent (laughs) because I knew he knew how it got bent, you know. He goes, I can fix it, Dad. He pulls out my hammer. Can I keep this hammer now? I look at it, it's kind of rusted because it's been in the backyard. Sure, that's now your hammer. He goes about the process of fixing the claw by putting it on the brick facade and beating on it with the hammer, further bending both prongs further in. I'm like, that's not, that's, that's yours now too. I mean, like it's, you're not restoring it, you're making it worse. <laughs> you know what I mean? We tend to do that a little bit. We go, okay, here's the challenge. Here's the project in front of me. I know how to fix it. Look, I'll fix it. <laughs> And we apply the same hammer to every challenge. And then look at God, like he looked at me and goes, see, look, I fixed it. God bless what I'm fixing. And our stance has to be first, how do you want us to fix this together? And so over the next few weeks, we're going to take a few of those. And for several weeks, this one's been on the plan. I kind of like put it off a week. So I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this one. We're going to tackle grief today through this gospel filter, loss. And I will be the first one to confess to you that when it comes to losing people in your life, God has been very gracious in my life. My grandparents were with me until I was well beyond college. In fact, I still have one still alive. And I'm getting old enough to be grandparent. You know what I mean? Like, I've been blessed. I have not experienced, I'm just being transparent with you. As a pastor, I have not experienced the loss of loved ones the way some of you have. Now, my wife, by contrast, lost her mom when she was 16. So she's much more acquainted with grief than I am, right? And understanding how to live into that. But I have experienced loss of things in my life. But I'm telling you that because some of this is like, hey, I'm going to preach about this. But God, (laughs) thank you. I have not had to like lament this like this. And so this comes out of a frame of I've experienced loss, but not loss of people. Does that make sense? So you feel free to go, Charlie, you have no idea. And I'll be like, you're right, I don't. So you may know better than me from experience, unfortunately, what I'm about to talk about. Which is why, one of the reasons why, even digging into this topic, it's like, okay, I'm a pastor. I need to help people understand how to grieve, especially with the gospel, but without experiencing a ton of it myself. Does that make sense? It's a challenge. And for some of you who have experienced it, can probably just tell your story and preach a better sermon about grief than I can cook up, Okay? But that's where we are. But I do know this. 
grieve. Christians grieve differently than people who don't know Christ. We just do. We experience loss different. We experience grief different. In fact, there's probably no time in our life, and I said this a couple weeks ago when I said we look at the world, we go, this is not the way it ought to be. There's probably no time in our life where we understand that better than when we lose somebody. Especially if we lose them before we're supposed to. Our heart goes, God, this is not how it's supposed to be. This isn't right. Loss makes that very clear, right? We can talk about, okay, the world's a little screwed up. I'm okay, I'm doing, but I'm doing okay. But when we lose somebody, we experience what I'm talking about much more intensely. That's not how it's supposed to be. It ought to be different. Our soul just cries out, no, that's not right. What are you talking about, Pat? Especially coming through a pandemic and the loss of lives, of lives that we shouldn't have lost. God, what in the world is going on? What are you doing with this? But at least we can have that conversation with God. Are you with me? If we don't have a relationship with the Creator and experience loss, it's just how it is. It's just how it is. And we can look at the same world and go, that's not right. And we feel powerless to do something about it. And even as a believer, we feel powerless when we lose. Right? No matter how much we try to cry and deny reality and bargain, we're actually left to face the way things are. They're not here anymore. Or whatever, that relationship is not here anymore. Or that person's not here anymore. Or whatever career, you know, my NFL prospects died a long time ago. Like, whatever it is, whatever it is. We experience loss. And sometimes we don't like to experience that loss. We medicate and hide and deny the fact that that's not the way reality is. When nothing can be further from the truth. In fact, when we get faced with it, and I know this more by proxy than experience, like I said, but grief and loss comes in waves. You, you have a day where you're okay, and then it's like turning your back on the ocean and it just pommels you out of nowhere. And it can be a little thing, something you did together, the anniversary of something, something you did that reminds you, somebody says something that reminds you of them, and you were fine until that moment. And then this wave just hits you again and washes over you again, and you don't know which way to turn. Just like when a wave hits you, you don't know which way is up. And maybe you even find yourself like standing in the middle of the ocean, like which, I can't even draw breath right now because I'm experiencing that. It's the little things. And it recedes for a while and everything's okay. And then it comes back. And then it recedes for a while and it comes back. And maybe over time, the waves are smaller and smaller. And they don't quite knock you off your game the way they did when they first hit. But that's what it feels like. And God's, in that grace, God's going, okay, yes, there is no, don't you wish? Hey, pastor, pray over me and I won't grieve anymore. Don't you wish that was the way it worked? As a pastor, I certainly do. I wish I could walk into a funeral setting and go, you're done hurting. Right? This is not the funeral you're looking for. You know what I mean? Like, I wish I could do something like that. that would be, for, by the way, if you don't know me, I'm a Star Wars nerd, so stuff like that pops in every now and then. But, like, there, I told you, this is interesting. So, I wish I could wave the wand, literally, and make the grief go away. Fortunately, that's not, unfortunately, that's not how it works. And we feel this intense grief. We feel this intense loss because we care. I told you I'm a Star Wars nerd, but I've also consumed WandaVision. And I told myself as a pastor I wouldn't do what every other pastor is doing in quoting this. But when all truth is God's truth. And if you're waiting to watch this, I'm spoiler alert. Okay? <laughs> Close your ears or something. But all truth is God's truth. And so sometimes even things like that, a TV show can hit a spiritual truth. And as Christians, we go, that's true. And we can call it still God's truth, even though it comes through a TV show. 
But there's a quote, and they're talking about loss of loved ones in WandaVision. And he goes, what is grief except love persevering? Now, there's not a Bible verse where you turn to your Bible and go, grief is love persevering. But that's true. We grieve, we suffer when we lose because we love. And when we're experiencing grief, what we're experiencing is love that continues even when they're not there to love anymore. Does that make sense? And it's intense and it comes in those waves because we love intensely. Now that doesn't mean when you stop grieving, and this is why some people stop grieving or don't want to stop grieving. They're afraid if they stop grieving, they will forget them or it means it does, they don't love them anymore. And that's just not true. We grieve in the first place because we love. I mean, somebody passes away, you don't know them. You don't feel it. When it's a close family member or a loved one, you feel it. Why? Because you love them. Grief, is, grief and loss is experiencing love again without that object in front of you to love. Therefore, grief is an expression of love. That's why we do things like have funerals and do things to remember folks who have gone before us. It's because we're still demonstrating our love for them when they're no longer with us. And that's right and that's appropriate and sometimes painful and sometimes awful. But it's still the way God has wired us to, to be and that is to love. But that reality, that way things is, the way thing is, way thing is, the way things are, <laughs> is the reality we live in. Now the difference is, because we know God, because we have a relationship with God, we're not stuck with is. And we don't experience grief only as the way things are. Because we know there's more to the story. If you have a Bible, turn to Romans chapter 8. And we're going to talk about what more of the story looks like. I'm going to skip around in chapter 8, so the words should be on the screen too. Or you can follow along in your Bibles. This is verse 1 and 2. There, there is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. So there's your gospel filter, right? There is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ when we die. We're set free. While we live, we are set free. The gospel says we are set free from the law of sin and death. Set free from the law. When we mess up, God forgives us. Set free from death because death is actually not the end. Those that we've lost, that's not the end. We know that because of what the scriptures tell us. That's a different experience when you know you will see the person you lost again. Then when you think this is it. For those of us who know Christ, you are set free from law and death. Death is no longer final. It's different. And it's different because of what God did. Jumping down to verse 12. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption when we cry, Abba, Father. It is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children then... Are heir, we are heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him, so we may also be glorified with him. Let me pause there for a second. So we have a whole new way of orienting our life where we understand that death is not final, that loss is not final. It's been changed. It's been, it has been redeemed by God himself. And Paul says... That redemption is not so you fall back into the way things were before. This is what we talked about last week. It's like, I've prayed the prayer and I go live how I want to. No, 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 no. 
We are in on something now. We are a part of something greater than ourselves now. We are moving forward. We are called, as the passage we just read, children of God. But being followers of Jesus does not exempt us from suffering and loss, does it? See, sometimes we get sold a bill of goods when we become a Christian. Pray this prayer. God has a perfect plan for your life. While somewhat true, that can be an intensely hard thing to say to somebody as soon as their life turns south after they start following Christ. Their assumption is, I'm not a Christian or that's not true about God. I thought he had a perfect plan for my life. Why is this happening to me? Why am I faced with this challenge? Why, am I, why is following Christ costing me so much if he has a perfect plan for my life? Why am I experiencing loss and grief after I gave my life to Jesus? I thought we were supposed to be exempt from that. That's not what Paul says. He says, you've been redeemed. There's now no condemnation, but you suffer with Christ. In other words, it's not if you might, su- you might suffer, when you suffer as a Christian. We talked about this weeks and weeks ago. Following Christ will cost you something, and maybe not a, lo- not a loved one, but it might cost you friends. It might cost you career. It might cost you options on Friday and Saturday night. It might cost you something. It's not easy, but it is simple, right? Following Jesus is clear and simple, but it is never easy. The difference, though, is that Christ is with us in the midst of whatever it is we're going through. That's a different experience of loss when you have Abba, Father, to lean on than when you don't. If your worldview is, this is all there is to it, then when you suffer loss, you suffer, you lose hope. I'll never see him again. It's awful. But when you're a follower of Christ and you realize that death itself will be redeemed one day and come to an end, pain and suffering will come to an end, loss will come to an end because of what Christ did, then we can still have hope in the middle of loss. Now, that doesn't make it go away. It doesn't mean we don't suffer because we're still loving someone who's no longer there. But we're not doing it alone. In fact, even Jesus grieved. You know this, right? Ready to memorize the Bible verse? I think it's John 15, 13. Jesus wept. There, he memorized the Bible verse. So nobody can ever say you don't know the Bible verse. That's the whole, that's the whole verse. Jesus wept. Do you know why he wept? The loss of his friend Lazarus. That's where that verse comes from. The interesting thing is, Jesus knew he was about to bring Lazarus back to life and still wept over what? Over the loss of his friend. Over what his friend probably had to go through to die. He still wept for him. Jesus knows what grieving feels like too. We don't think about Jesus that way. Jesus floats around about four feet off the ground and prays over people. and That's that's how we picture Jesus in our head. He's perfect, doesn't do anything wrong. He just floats through life when he was here on earth. I mean, like he's just floating around doing, I'm Jesus, everything's going to be okay. He wept. He suffered. He was hungry. He was tired. He stubbed his toe. (laughs) Like, Like, we don't picture, we picture Jesus like he can do no wrong. He has no pain, no suffering while he was here on earth. Are you kidding me? He even said, I have nowhere to lay my head. He slept out. He camped. Anybody been camping? He camped out for like three years, right? He slept on the, you're slept on the ground. Dads, if you have sons, you go camping with them. You're like, we're not going to do this very often. You know, like he slept on the ground for three years. Probably more than that. But we know he was in mission doing that. He knows what our suffering feels like. And what he did by being faithful, we read this earlier, faithful, considering heaven not something to be held on to, but became one of us and became obedient even until death on a cross. He experienced everything we experienced. And he did all of that to redeem even our grief and suffering. Because if he had not died and been resurrected, then we would have no hope in loss. But the scriptures call him the firstborn of 
the children of God, right? The whole new family that we've been adopted into, we just read it. We can call him dad. We can call God dad. And when we're grieving and when we're suffering, that's exactly what we need. Hey, dad, I'm suffering and I'm hurting. And he knows what that feels like. In fact, he suffered to redeem suffering. Now think about that. He was obedient to death on a cross to redeem suffering itself. Because this is the other thing we say when somebody suffers loss, right? It's all part of God's plan. He's going to work it out. You ever heard that at a funeral? That's not really comforting to people, by the way. (laughs) It was part of God's plan that he went through that and now he's gone. That's not a great message. When you're in the midst of grief, you don't want to hear that the suffering you're experiencing was part of God's plan. You don't want to hear that. Because what does that say? God either couldn't or didn't do something about it. That ought to make you angry. Right? Who wants to follow that God? He either didn't do anything or couldn't do anything about the loss that I'm experiencing right now. That's terrible. But let me tell you that grief and loss and death were never part of the original design, the way things ought to be. Remember, created, order, death itself is not natural. The separation of our soul from our bodies was never part of the original design. Death, evil, suffering, sin, earthquakes, tornadoes, cancer were never part of God's original plan. But what he saw was what he could do about it. At the outset, by the way, Adam and Eve sin. He kicks them out of the garden, but what does he tell them? Eve... One of your descendants will crush his head. In Genesis 3, God already knew what he was going to do about sin and pain and anguish and loss and death and chaos. He was going to redeem everything and restore it. We never understand his timing. We never understand his plan. In the midst of it, we go, how in the world does this even work? But God's not bound by any of that. He's been working on a plan since Genesis 1, (laughs) really, technically. Because he had a world that he intended. But he gave us the freedom to disregard that and to take a garden tool and go, I'm going to fix it my way and beat it with a hammer. Because that's what we do when we sin. This looks great, but I want to make it mine. And God goes, I originally designed that to look this way to be used for this reason. But you, by your own willfulness and stubbornness and selfishness have taken it to something I didn't intend it to be. But I can do something about that and I will do something about that. My son Jesus. He redeemed it. And yes, even though we don't like to hear it expressed that way, he can and will redeem even the loss of someone in our life. You see... When a Christian suffers loss, not only do we personally experience it different, the world sees us experience it differently. When a Christian has cancer and goes through cancer, they experience it differently from someone who does not have a church and a God around them. Do they still hurt? Of course. Do they still suffer? Absolutely. But they experience that differently because we have hope. Let me keep reading. Chapter 8, verse 18. I consider that suffering at this present time not worth comparing with the glory that's about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. 
that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. Not only the creation, but we ourselves who are the first fruits of the Spirit. Groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we, ha- we were saved. Now, hope that is not seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait with patience. What's Paul saying? All of creation has been subjected to sin. Every bit of it. Creation itself is waiting for God to do his restoration project. And we, as followers of Christ, know that this is not the way the world ought to be. And so we groan inwardly too. When we experience grief and loss, what do we want to do more than anything? We want it to be fixed. We want it to be restored. We want to change it. It's hardwired into who we are to renovate everything. And so there's an aspect of salvation in following Jesus that has already been saved. We have already been saved. But there's an aspect that has not yet been realized too. You with me on that? You were saved. You are being saved. And you will be saved. If you follow Christ, you were saved from sin and death. You were set free from the law of sin and death. You are being saved. You are being renovated. You are being made new inwardly by the Holy Spirit at work in your life. And one day you will be saved from sin and death itself. So when Paul talks about salvation, you've got to figure out which salvation he's talking about. (laughs) Because sometimes he's talking about all three or a different one or this one. And you go, wait, he says, from, I won't be saved unless I do this. He may be talking about inward renovation. Which saved is Paul using when he says saved? It's an important key to understanding Paul. You know, unless you follow, obey all of God's laws, you won't be saved. Wait, I thought I was saved by faith. You are. Wait, what? <laughs> you see what I mean? You were saved from sin and death by, by faith. You are being saved by being obedient to Christ and being renovated. And when God does his, completes his project, all of creation will be made back to the way it ought to be. Except it won't be a garden anymore. It'll be a city. It started in a garden. There was the fall. Now we're in this place where God, Jesus has made it possible to be in a relationship with him. But one day we'll be in a city where there is no more suffering, no more death, no more grief, no more loss. Because everything will have been restored to what God originally intended. And what makes us angry is, we want that today, and I don't blame you. You ever had that prayer, especially during a pandemic, it's like, could you fix this? Now, I want to sit right next to somebody in a football stadium. Like, could you fix this? Now, I'm done with masks. I'm done with pain and loss of loved ones who shouldn't be dying but are because of this. I'm done with it. And God goes, yeah, me too. But he's going to redeem this, this too. The church has gone online. Just say it. I had a church before I came here of like 50 people on Sunday morning. And when we went to online services, there was like 300 views, whatever that means. But way more than the 50 people that were hearing me before were hearing me after that. God is going to redeem all of this some way, shape, fashion, or form. Because what the enemy intended for evil, I think we just sang that, right? What the enemy intended for evil, God will find a way to restore and to make better. In fact, this last little passage here is 1 Thessalonians 4. I didn't give this to the team, so I'll just read it to you. I do that to them every now and then, right? 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 and 14. But we do not want to be, uh, you, and you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others, as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. Now, as Paul saying, it sounds like Paul saying, 
Christians shouldn't grieve. Don't grieve like the others do, like non-Christians do. That's not what he's saying. He's saying we grieve differently because of Christ. He says, don't grieve like the others who have no hope. We grieve as people with hope because of Christ. Again, I wish I could go, no more grief. I don't have that kind of power. But Jesus does. And he's not saying we don't grieve. He's saying we grieve differently. Last part of this, verse 35 to 39. This is a word of encouragement in the midst of a grief sermon. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Not grief, not cancer, not suffering, not pain, not loss, not evil, not anything can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing. And so for those of us who suffer, we suffer as ones who have hope. That the waves will stop. That the loss will be redeemed. And even those we have lost as loved ones, we will see again because of what Jesus did for us. Let me pray for us, and then we're going to take communion together. And we take communion because that is where our hope rests. Not in our own ability, because we're just going to take the fork and hit it with a hammer and make it worse. (laughs) Our hope rests in the work and person of Jesus. Let's pray. God, as we worship this morning, we ask that you would fill our hearts with hope, especially for those of us who are grieving and have lost. We pray with our whole hearts, this is not the way it ought to be. But we invite you to restore us to the way it ought to be. Not just the way it was, but to something even better. Encourage us if we are are going through suffering right now. Encourage our hearts if we are enduring pain right now. And remind us of the hope that we have in you. In your precious son's name, amen. This is fun. This is communion. This is why we have hope. You have, can I call it this in church? You have a cheat sheet. (laughs) I just called the communion order a cheat sheet. That's not going to get me ordained anywhere. Um, You have a card on here called Holy, it says Holy Communion on one side, and it says the Great Thanksgiving on the other. Okay? Hopefully you have access to that. They were on all the chairs or whatever. We're going to take some communion together. We're going to pray. I'm going to, we're going to, this is responsive, like the reading we did a little while ago. So if you look on the side, this is the Great Thanksgiving. There's lettering in black that I read. There's lettering in red that you read corporately together as we prepare our hearts to take communion. And then when we're done with communion, the praise team is going to sing us out of here. So take your card out, and we'll, get, we'll, we'll start there. The Lord be with you. We lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, 
And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. And so, in remembrance of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, in unison with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, gathered here. And on these gifts of bread and wine, through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup. He said, this is now the new covenant in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. And then he made him a promise and said, that whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, do this in remembrance of me until everything has been restored and we eat and drink again in my Father's kingdom. Even as he was establishing the covenant, he was pointing us to the day that the restoration project is complete. Our reason for hope. And we have some protocols in place because of the pandemic. We have prepackaged juice and bread up here for you. It'll be a long time before we dip the same bread in the same cup. That's just the reality of our world these days. So I'm going to pray. The band is going to play. The altar will be open. You can come and take the cup and return to your seat. But then we will take together. All right? So just take it and hold it for a minute. And then we will take the elements together. Let me pray. And butt the table. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for a day of worship. Thank you for a day in which we can look to you and say, you are our reason for hope. You are our reason for joy. You are our reason for facing suffering, grief, and loss differently. Fill our hearts with joy in the midst of our suffering. Remind us that it is you who suffered so we could be with you again. Remind us of the work you are doing in our hearts. Remind us that we belong to you as children of God. And that our hearts can cry, Abba, Father, even when we know the world is not as it ought to be. Lord, as we take these elements, we pray your grace upon our life. We pray your forgiveness for our sins. And we ask that you would restore us. In your precious holy name, amen. The table is open when you're ready. Okay, helpful communion tip. There's two layers. The first layer is the bread. Don't peel the bottom layer back yet. There's a thin plastic clear layer that gets you the bread. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat.
And when you've successfully navigated layer number two, <laughs> the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Amen. Let's stand together. This is continuing to respond. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. Name of Jesus Christ, my King. Beautiful name it is, nothing can bear this. Beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. You didn't want heaven without us. And Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. And what could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. Wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Think about these words. Let the truth well up in your heart. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. Silence the boast of sin and grace. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you have raised to life again. Come on. You have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. powerful name it is you have no rival you have no rival you have no equal now and forever God you reign yours is the kingdom yours is the power yours is the name Powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus.
caught all the announcements before with the beautiful video that Parker produced, but I want to make this one, this invitation again, and that is this. Um, if there's a topic you would like us to address through the gospel filter, I'm taking requests. I have a plan, but I'm taking requests. So if there is something you would love for us to go, let's walk through this is, can, will with, then fill out the connection card and get it to me, and I will put that into the mix, if you will. All right? Because I want this to be a series where you go, my life is dealing with this right now. What does the gospel have to do with that? Conversation. All right? Because the gospel is the way that has to do with, the gospel has to do with everything, whether we see it or not sometimes. So now, go and receive this benediction. Now to him who is able to do far more than you could ever hope or imagine, even in the midst of loss. May he give you peace and joy and love in the midst of suffering. And as we say at Connection, best of all, God is with us. God is with us. See you next Sunday.